Good evening, everybody. We have um, a very incredible show planned for you all tonight. Really, really looking forward to dialoguing with you all and talking to you all about the Deuterocanon, Canon, all things Deuterocanonical Canonical related. We're going to have a lot of fun talking about uh, the Book of Wisdom, Wisdom Chapter 2 in particular. Now, I know today is a very, very special day for a lot of people that consider themselves to be part of apostolic Christianity. And indeed, uh, today we are uh, celebrating the bodily resurrection of our Lord and Savior. So today we'll be talking about the Book of Wisdom. I am thrilled to be here with you all. Um, thrilled to be able to dialogue with you all. Uh, Josh, how you doing, brother, there in the, in the chat? Uh, hopefully more people uh, join in and tune in. Uh, I'm thrilled to be able to dialogue and talk to you all about the Book of Wisdom, the death of our Lord, the crucifixion of Christ, and the bodily resurrection of our Lord and Savior. It is a late evening. <laughs> we might not have our usual crowd that we usually have. Uh, I know a number of people are probably really pooped from having celebrated the bodily resurrection all day. If you were able to find Mass today, God bless you. If you just were unable to go out and you stayed home to be safe and to take care of yourself, God bless you and your family as well. And I hope today you celebrated life, celebrated everything that the bodily resurrection of our Lord entails. I am thrilled to be here with you all. Now, what are we going to be talking about tonight? I know it may be a little late for a lot of people, depending on where you are in the world. We won't go too long. We'll go about an hour. What are we going to look at? We're going to look at the book of uh, Wisdom, chapter 2. It's clearly a prophecy, clearly a prophecy that we recognize the gospel of Matthew utilizes. Matthew utilizing the... Now, we recognize the gospel of Matthew. Um, it does... Uh, the language a lot of people recognize is similar to the suffering servant language, but indeed the language is much more in tune grammatically with the Book of Wisdom, Chapter 2. That being said, the Book of Wisdom, Chapter 2, clearly has a prophecy of our Lord and Savior. Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, views that as having been fulfilled in Christ, that prophecy foreshadowed in the Book of Wisdom, Matthew views that as being fulfilled in Christ. So we'll look at Wisdom 2 briefly, and then we're going to look and see what is going on. Do we have, um, is it a mere modern-day kind of Catholic fanciful viewing of Wisdom 2 being fulfilled? In Christ, in the person of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the Son of God. Well, we're going to also look at the early church fathers and see, do they catch that reference? Do they note as to what is being said here? And indeed, when we look, uh, I like to start with wisdom. Let's go to 2 8. Let us crown ourselves with roses before they be withered. Let no meadow escape our riot. Let none of us go without his part in luxury. Let us everywhere leave tokens of joy, for this is our portion, and this is our lot. Let us oppress the poor man, just man, and not spare the widow, nor honor the ancient gray hairs of the aged. But let our strength be the law of justice, for that which is feeble is found to be nothing worth. Let us therefore lie in wait for the just, because he is not for our return, and is contrary to our doings, and upbraideth us with transgressions of the law, and divulgeth against us the sins of our way of life. Then here we go. He boasteth that he hath the knowledge of God, and calls himself the son of God. He became a censor of our thoughts. He is grievous unto us, even to behold, for his life is not like other men's, and his ways are very different. We are esteemed by him as triflers. And he abstaineth from our ways as from filthiness, and he preferreth the latter end of the just, and glorious that he hath God for his father. He has God for his father? What on earth is being talked about here? He's the son of God. He has God for his father. 
Let us then see if his words be true, and let us prove what shall happen, now, and we shall know what his end shall be. For if he be the true Son of God, he will defend him and will deliver him from the hands of his enemies. Let us examine him by outrages and tortures that we may know his meekness and try his patience. Let us condemn him to a most shameful death. For thou shalt be respect had unto him by his works. These things they thought and were deceived, for their own malice blinded them. And they knew not the secrets of God, nor hope for the wages of justice, nor esteemed the honor of holy souls. The language being utilized here, <clears throat> as you know very well, as we find in, in the Gospel of Matthew. So we're clearly aware of the power in this text. Now, what do we mean by the power in this text? Well, we recognize that the early fathers, they were very meticulous in their manner of what kind of prophecies would come to fruition. And indeed, the early church fathers recognized that the Book of Wisdom was fulfilled. And uh, I am, uh, I will pull up, we're going to go to Matthew 27, 41 to 43. Let's go to Matthew 27. Now, I, I, I love going over this text with you live in... Uh, by the way, if anybody's there in the chat, I see we have a good amount of people tuning in. Uh, hit that like button. Uh, a good amount of people tuning in, but nobody hitting like. Hit that like button, please. Um, let me know that you're there. Let me know, know that you're enjoying the session. We have uh, over 100 people watching. God bless for that. God bless you wherever you're watching the world. Hit the like button, please. And let me know how you're enjoying the session. So Matthew chapter 27, a lot of people don't realize, but clearly the gospel author, the author of Matthew, Matthew, St. Matthew, is hearkening right back to wisdom too here. Let's look at Matthew 27, 41. In like manner, also the chief priests with the scribes and ancients mocking said, he saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him now deliver him if he will have him, for he said, I am the son of God. Notice how that kind of particular language is only found in one other place. Now, do we have similar language in the suffering servant in the book of Isaiah? No doubt. But all of the markers, all of the identifying markers grammatically and in the way the fathers noted it, are found in the Book of Wisdom, chapter 2. Clearly, what we're seeing grammatically in Wisdom 2, look at this, you trust in God, let him now deliver him, if you will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. I am the Son of God. This is very important language. For if he be the true Son of God, he will defend him and will deliver him from the hands of his enemies. It is a clear prophecy that has become fulfilled in the Gospels, in the time of Christ, in the very person of our Lord and Savior. It has come to be fulfilled in Christ. It doesn't get more amazing, more incredible than this. We clearly see this being fulfilled in the person of Jesus the Christ. Now, <clears throat> We recognize a parallelism there um, that we find grammatically, without a shadow of a doubt. This, uh, the, the connection here is, is, is incredible. And um, by the way, for people wondering how deep this connection goes, check out my dear brother Gary's books. He's written in the Deuter Canon. There's nobody better, nobody better than Gary. I am blessed to be able to run this channel with him, the Apocrypha Apocalypse, and we have a ton of more incredible stuff coming your way. A ton of stuff that I am working on in Spanish on the Deuter Canon, you'll find nowhere else. The kind of shows that we have that we're putting together for you 
that will be mind-blowingly great. I mean, we're thrilled to be putting out this kind of content. Go check out Gary's books. The point of connection of I am, he said, I am the son of God. It fits perfectly with the Deuterocanonical Book of Wisdom. Remember, <clears throat> he trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he wants him for you. He said, I am the son of God. This is the only place that you're going to find in the whole Old Testament which shows a direct, a direct connection to the true son of God. By the way, that can be translated, that can literally be translated Yahweh, by the way. We'll look at the Greek in just a moment. The expectation that he would be rescued and delivered by persecution. This is what led, this is what drove those tyrannical Jewish leaders to mock Christ, to mock his claim of divine, of being the divine son, the divine son of the father, comes directly from the book of wisdom. The connection there that is made grammatically is the reason the early church fathers utilized wisdom too, and they utilized it. Now, was the expectation that the God the Father would take him off of the cross? No, the expectation was that he would die as the book of wisdom foreshadows, but that the rescuing and the triumph would be just as Matthew and the other gospels say, that he would not be abandoned to Hades, the way Jonah was not abandoned to Hades. But as the scriptures foretold, that kind of rescuing would be the bodily resurrection of Christ as he was, as he rose from the dead. As he rose from the dead, that would be the rescue. He was not trapped in the tomb to rot, to become corrupt. He rose in a glorified body. That's why we have such clear imagery in the book of Acts of the incredible light that, that comes with the bodily resurrection of Christ, that comes with his very bodily presence, something that you need to pay attention to, something very important in terms of the biblical text. So we, we note the connection that we've got here with Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, and with Wisdom too. The clear connection grammatically, the clear prophecy being laid down, it's undeniable. But grammatically, how, how do we look at the text? Grammatically, it is very important to note that we can literally connect the fact that the Son of God is literally giving us the fact that he is the Son of Yahweh. Remember the usage of kurios in the Old Testament, depending on the context, kurios very often means Yahweh. It is the Greek for our almighty God and Savior, depending on context. And in here, by the way, the Greek that I'm showing you, uh, we, we, whenever we do any kind of shows for you all, we put in meticulous research for you all because we want you all to get the very best that can be given. The very best. And uh, the compilation of the Greek here, I tip my hat and give credit. It was given to me several months back from my dear brother Gary um, in a project that he was working on. He said, look, check this out. Everything Gary does is mind-blowing. There's nobody better than him when it comes to the Deuterocanon. We che he checked out the the, the T um, the TLGs the Sars Lingua Grecia. Anytime you do real research, you've got to go there. That is why we tell you all: look at people that are doing real, actual research. We're not trying to be mean people. We're not trying to be meanies. We're telling you: if you're doing work on the Deuterocanon, it's a complex topic. You have got to be able to go 
back to the original source material. We've had people out there that have critiqued the stuff Gary has done and the stuff I have done. The people that have done that, the massive majority, have no clue how to go back to read original source material. They don't know how to do it. They don't know how to read anything out of English, outside of the realm of English. And there's nothing wrong with not being able to read original first-hand source material, but what is wrong is not doing actual critical research. The amount of research done here, you've got to utilize the TLG, the Thesaurus Lingua Grecia. You have got to utilize it. And utilizing that, Gary pulled up the incredible thing. So there's amazing theology right behind the Book of Wisdom, chapter two. He's the son of Yahweh, the son of God, that incredible title that our Lord and Savior had when he became incarnate, came to earth. And well, even before that, we've got the amazing prophecies. But even more so, in the New Testament, this kind of title that people recognize as a sign, a title of divinity. Well, what kind of a son is he? a son by the tons? Of course not. He is the only begotten son. And by the way, uh, if you're wondering how that, uh, that Greek term is utilized, uh, go check out my channel. Uh, over at Patristic Pillars, William Al YouTube.com backslash William Albert. I've done sessions with uh, my dear brother, Sam Shimon, where we've, we've analyzed and we've, uh, we've examined that term in the biblical Greek, as well as the way it was utilized in early history, as well as the unanimous usage of that term in the early church. So <laughs> when you look at these Greek texts here in front of you, when you examine the kind of texts that you have in front of you, you'll note Joshua 1, 1, Joshua 1 13, Joshua 11, 12. So on and on you go, we're looking at Septuagintal texts. We're looking at the Greek from the Septuagint. Now, what is the point of looking at the Greek from the Septuagint? It's very important. By the way, we've got the text here, right here in front of you. We've got it right in front of you. The servant of the Lord, the servant of the Lord. Over and over, you've got that Greek word kurios right here, right here, kuriou, from the Greek word kurios. Everywhere you go, Psalm 17, 1, to paidi kuriou. Psalm 112, 1, paides kurion. Over and over, and then finally we've arrived. Wisdom. Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 13. Look at this. Theu kai paida kuriu. Right here, he professes to have knowledge of God and styles himself a child, a son of God, a child of the Lord, the son of God, literally the son of Yahweh. Now you may be asking, why is that even important, William, because this prophecy, when it comes to fruition and to fulfillment in the New Testament, in the manner in which the gospel author of Matthew is quoting it, it's massively important, because he's not just any kind of paida kuriu, he's not just any kind of child of the Lord, he's not just any kind of son of God, he's a son of Yahweh. He's the son of God Almighty, and he's that divine son of God Almighty. How else would he have conquered death on the cross? The, this kind of theology is the kind of theology that we really hope that you, uh, that really brings you closer to uh, a deeper love for the Deuterocanonical text. Uh, the, um, the amount of incredible media information that you're going to find in the Deuterocanon is really mind-blowing. That is why Wisdom 2 was so instrumental in being utilized in the early church. They recognized, they said, what are we looking at here? We've got a clear prophecy. They were taught, and the early fathers taught and trained by the apostles, and those that came afterwards taught and trained by those that trained those that the apostles had trained. <laughs> you get the kind of imagery that I'm giving you, the incredible Ignatius of Antioch taught and trained by John, the great bishop Polycarp of Smyrna, who was who dialogued and spoke with eyewitnesses. Can you believe that? Wrap your head around that. 
incredible ancient pedigree. He taught and trained Irenaeus. Irenaeus taught and trained others. And the unbroken line, the unbroken line goes on and on and on. And in the early fathers, we have that unbroken line. And in the early church fathers, we have the connection to the recognition that the gospel author of Matthew was hearkening to wisdom too. There's no doubt. There's not merely, oh, well, you know what? I think that wisdom too is, you know, it warms my belly. It might have some nice teaching. No, it is quoted in a prophetic manner. It is prophecy that has come into its full circle. It is prophecy of the first order. This is something that at times seems to get forgotten, that many times people just don't realize how important the Book of Wisdom is. Very important, which is why it was utilized from the apostolic era on in every single early church council, every single early church council utilized, included the Book of Wisdom in their biblical canon. That kind of ancient pedigree is a kind of pedigree that should not and cannot be ignored. And indeed it wasn't when we look at Hippolytus of Rome in his Contra Jews, we're at a very early time period where we've got authors, we've got people that are, I'm going to grab my drink real quick. Okay, we've got people that are recognizing these prophecies. Indeed, look at the language of Hippolytus of Rome. I produce now the prophecy of Solomon. This is a prophecy. This isn't a mere fanciful tale that has no historical truth within it. It's a prophecy which speaks of Christ and announces clearly and perspicu perspicuously things concerning the Jews. And those which not only are befalling them at the present time, but those too which shall befall them in the future age, on account of the contumacy and audacity which they exhibited toward the Prince of Life. For the prophet says, the ungodly said, reasoning with themselves, but not aright, that is about Christ. Let us lie in wait for the righteous, as we read earlier, remember, because he is not for our turn, and he is clean contrary to our doings and words, and upbraids us with our offending the law, and professes to have knowledge of God. And he calls himself the child of God, a son of God. Remember, that can be logically translated as child of Yahweh. And then he says, he is grievous to us even to behold, for his life is not like other men's, and his ways are of another fashion. We are esteemed as him as counterfeits, and as he abstains from our ways as from filthiness, and pronounces the end of the just to be blessed. And again, listen to this, O Jew. None of the righteous or prophets called himself the son of God. You catch that? And therefore, as in the person of the Jews, Solomon speaks again of the righteous one, who is Christos, Christ. Thus he was made to reprove our thoughts and makes his boast that God is his father. Let us see then if his words be true and let us prove what shall happen in the end for him. For the just man be the son of God. Here we go. He will help him and deliver him from the hand of his enemies. Let us condemn him with a shameful death. For by his own saying, he shall be respected. Hippolytus of Rome recognized that this was prophetic. When you hear argumentation being levied and we're, be, you get told, well, you know, the Deuterocanon might have some things you know, the early fathers might quote them, you know, they thought certain things were valuable, or, you know, maybe it talked about, you know, historical events, like events that occurred in the Maccabean books. Stop. When people put that across you, 
when people try to deceive you with those poor, horrifically bad arguments, you stop in the tracks and you show them how the early fathers utilized them as holy writ, called them prophetic. Now, if people say, well, you know, it's got to say a certain, it's got to have a certain phraseology. It has to say, as the scripture says, for them to have utilized it as scripture. You need to stop with such poor arguments. When you hear those arguments, that shows you the individuals that are levying those are. By the way, you don't, you don't find these kinds of arguments among the educated that have studied the issues of the canon. You don't find them. People laugh at those arguments. They're laughable. And they're, they're just poor arguments. You need to look at how did the early fathers utilize these texts? Did they call them sacred? Did they call them the word of God? Did they call it holy writ? Did they call it prophetic? Every box is ticked. They're all given a check mark. The Deuter canon is holy writ. It is scripture. And if it is not in your Bible, you've got to wonder and ask yourself, what is happening, man? Where can I get one of those Bibles, man? Where can I get one of those Bibles, real Bibles, the fullness of the faith? There's many places. <laughs> <laughs> many places where you can get them. Get yourself one of those Bibles and get yourself the books Gary is putting out on the topic. There's no better on the topic. Look, Gary doesn't have to worry. Gary goes to bed at night and Gary is the man when it comes to this topic. He's so humble. Gary is my brother. He's one of my best friends. I love the guy with all my heart. And he's the best at what he does when it comes to this topic. And that is why I'm telling you, you've got to get his books from the topic. The kind of stuff we're putting out, you're not going to find anywhere else in any other channel. Where can you find stuff that the actual people that are putting the material out are translating to other languages? Not having other people translate their stuff for him, but the actual people are translating stuff from other languages to English and then two other languages, such as Spanish or other languages later on down the line, you're not going to find it anywhere else. you got to subscribe to this channel, share it, ask other people to subscribe, make it blow up. We have so many amazing guests coming for you. we got Scott Hahn in a few weeks. It's going to be amazing. Can't wait for that. A few weeks, it's not till May, but <clears throat> that'll be a lot of fun. Cyprian of Carthage, Contra the Jews, 210 to 250. In the wisdom of Solomon, he starts it off by showing the wisdom of Solomon in his eyes is a biblical text. Josh, you're correct, brother, brother. It is low-hanging fruit. And we've got to do better. Whenever we utilize certain arguments, what our goal has got to be, it has got to be to do better. It should be our goal, our aim to want to do much, much better. So right here, let us lay, he's quoting Solomon. How does he utilize it? Let us lay hold of the righteous because he, he, because he is disagreeable to us and is contrary to our works and reproaches us with our transgressions of the law. He professes that he has the knowledge of God and calls himself the son of God. He's become to us an exposure of our thoughts. He is grievous unto us even to look upon, because his life is unlike to others, and his ways are, are changed. We are esteemed by him as frivolous, and he restrains himself from our ways, as if from uncleanness, and he extols the last end of the righteous and boasts that he has God. He has God for his father. Let us see then if his words are true, and let us try what will come to him. Let us interrogate him with reproach and torture and torture that we may know his reverence and prove his patience. Let us condemn him with the most shameful death. These things they considered and erred. So <clears throat> what is Cyprian saying? He's actually connecting this as a prophecy that came true. Why else would he say these things they considered and erred? He's reading Solomon for you and then saying, these are the evil Jews that, uh, that 
put him to death. They're part of those that were that put him to death. Can you believe that? They are the ones that put him to death. So it came true. This prophecy came true. Why else would it say these things they considered and erred? Edmund, Edmund Russo, no, brother, it is not disabled. Uh, most people just don't want to talk tonight. I don't know why. We've got a good amount of people tuning in. Thank the good Lord for that. Uh, but I don't know. People, people just don't want to talk. People, if you all are watching, please hit that like button, share it, and communicate with me in the chat. I see a lot of people talking, but you all are very, very shy. Let me know what you think of the stream. Are you enjoying it? Is it edifying you? Don't be shy to talk. Please, you don't have to, but but there's no need to be shy to talk. So, we will continue. And as we continue, I'm trying to figure out how to, here we go. Okay, we're back. So <laughs> Cyprian views this as having come to fulfillment. It has been fulfilled in the person of Christ. More prophecy, more and more prophecy. Edmund Russo, brother, I love you with all my heart, my friend. God bless you and bless your family. Bless you immensely, my dear friend. So <clears throat> we read onward. For their maliciousness has blinded them. And they knew not the sacraments of God. And look at this, he's right with other prophecy. This is a sign that Cyprian viewed it as prophetic because also in Isaiah, he's connecting them. There's two prophecies here. To claim that he viewed as one as only prophetic is to ignore the clear language being utilized in the great bishop of Carthage. It's incredible. Also in Isaiah, see how the righteous perishes, and no man understands, and the righteous men are taken away, and no man regards. For the righteous man is taken away from the face of unrighteous, as it is burial shall be in, in peace. So more and more, everywhere we look, a, a clear connection to, to not merely, you know, the text is fanciful. You know, it was okay. No, it was prophetic for these early authors, these early authors of these early patristic pillars. Emil, Emil, I mean, great point, man. I mean, I've, I've done the same, Emil. Uh, I frequently point people to the Book of Wisdom. I mean, great job on you there, brother. I frequently turn them to the Book of Wisdom, in my opinion, it's one of the best books. And the amount of fathers that find uh, incredible faith, uplifting, prophetic fulfillment is just tons of stuff. There's just so much stuff. Ambrose of Milan, the Lord reproaches the Jews. I made myself poor for you. I suffered for you, and you've raised impious hands, saying, let us rid ourselves of the righteous one, because he is useless to us. Ambrose makes that connection as well. Cyril of Alexandria. Though they had arrested the all-powerful Lord, they bound him nonetheless, the very one who came to free us from the snares of the devil. To loose the bonds of sin, they led him to Annas, the father-in-law of Caiaphas about whom it can be argued that in a certain way he was the designer and instigator of the crime against Christ. So what is occurring here? What is occurring when he is, and let, let us read onward. It is likely that it was from him that the traitor who had been paid off with money requested the cohort to arrest Christ. Christ was therefore first brought to him. It seemed that he wanted to render true and actually present what had been said through the words of the prophet can you believe that? 
everywhere we've looked, the fathers are recognizing these words as not merely uplifting, but the words of the prophet, prophetic, God-inspired text. Let us bind the righteous one because he is useless to us. And in fact, Christ truly was useless to the Jews, not because he really was useless, but because lovers of sin and pleasure that they were, it seemed that he brought them nothing good. Rather, <clears throat> he brought a righteousness that exceeded the law, clearly explaining what was pleasing to God, who loves virtue. The law offered no such way, only indicating through shadows and darkness, indirectly and with difficulty, what might be of benefit to its hearers. Thus, the sunlight is in a certain way useless for one with a disease of the eyes, and he receives no benefit because his illness prevents it. And as healthy food seems more useless to sick people and others, though by it they would recover the healthy desire, so also the Lord seemed useless to the Jews, though he was the author of salvation. They, in fact, did not love salvation. So yet again, yet another uh, early father, and we have yet to delve deep into church history. When I say deep, I mean uh, getting close to the medieval era. I've heard arguments brought up by individuals that will say, well, okay, um, uh, you know, you get to the point of fathers that are, writ are writing later, late 500s, late 600s, you know, kind of indic indicating that that doesn't count. We've looked at fathers at a very early period and we're progressively going through history. Indeed, there are more, but I chose a select few to read with you all this evening because indeed we don't have time to go through them all. I realize that it is a beautiful Easter evening. I hope you've had an incredible time celebrating with your family. I hope you've been blessed with your family. I hope you were able to get to church today if you could, if you're able to. I know some people told me, you know what, William, I couldn't find the church I was open. If, if you were able to, you're blessed and thank the good Lord I was able to to get to Mass earlier. What a great feeling that is. What a great feeling. And our Lord is bodily risen from the dead. What is the point of reading all this? The point is the Father has read Wisdom 2, and they recognized very clearly Wisdom 2 was talking about the death of our Lord and Savior. But what is the rescue? What is the rescue? The rescue is that the Father did not allow the Son the son did not remain to corrupt in the grave. He rose bodily from the dead. The promises from God the Father were true. All the prophecies that he would send his angelos, his messenger, who was the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, and comes to us as our incarnate Lord and Savior in the womb of our immaculate mother Mary. All of this is amazing. The Father has recognized this. They recognize that wisdom too spoke of his, the shameful manner in which they put our Savior to death, but he didn't remain dead. He rose bodily from the dead. And that is the message of Easter. That has always been. Emil <clears throat> says that there's a strong connection, Wisdom 724 and Colossians 115. There is, brother, there sure is. Um, I might uh, examine that one day. Well, we'll look at all of the grammatical markers in there, but there, there is a very strong reference. I don't know. One thing I haven't looked at, and I'd love to look at it, are if there are any early fathers that recognize that connection. I wouldn't be surprised if there were. I would not be surprised at all. Hmm. Onward we go. Onward we go. <clears throat> Remember, the, the theme of today is the bodily resurrection of Christ. How do we recognize wisdom too? We look at it as a prophecy. Did that prophecy ever come true? It came true as we examined in Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew earlier. Grammatically, it lines up with wisdom too, and it is not the mere fanciful opinion of a Catholic or an Orthodox that reads and makes that connection and 
ties the dots together and says, look, it sounds similar. No, it doesn't only sound similar. It's a prophecy. That prophecy is fulfilled in the Gospel of Matthew. We recognize it being fulfilled, and the early church fathers recognized that as well. They didn't merely view it as, well, it's an uplifting text. No, they saw it being fulfilled in the Gospel of Matthew, and when they hearkened to it, they said, this is prophecy. This prophecy came true in our Lord and our Savior, our incarnate God. Gregory the Great in his commentary on Job. Very good commentary, by the way, if anybody has ever, ever looked at it. By the way, I still see we have a good amount of people tuning in. Very cool. Very cool. I'm thrilled that so many of y'all are joining the show. Comment if you want. Do you have any questions? The chat is open for you to talk. A lot of y'all are quiet tonight. Gregory the Great, commentary in Job, for God's witnesses are they who bear witness by the practice of holy works. What are the rewards of truth that shall overtake the elect? Hence to those whom we see to have suffered for the sake of truth, we style in the Greek tongue martyrs, witnesses. And the Lord says by John and the angel's voice, even in those days, where an Antipas was my faithful witness, who was slain among you. Now the Lord renews his martyrs against us, his witnesses, when he multiplies the lives of the elect to confront our wickedness for the purpose of convicting and of instructing us. And so his witnesses are renewed against us in all, in that all things that they do are opposed to the ends and aims of our wickedness. Hence too, the word of truth is called an adversary. Where it is said by the voice of the mediator in the gospel, agree with thine adversary quickly while thou art in the way with him. And the sons of perdition in their persecution say concerning the same redeemer for, and he is clean contrary to our doings and soon afterwards for his life is not like other men's. You catch that? His life is not like other men's. Does the Lord renew his witnesses against us? In that the good things which we neglect to do ourselves, he shows us to be done by others, to our upbraiding, that we are who are not inflamed by precepts, may at least be stirred up by examples that in longing after righteousness, our mind may account nothing to be difficult to itself, that it seems to be done perfectly by others, and is very commonly brought to pass, that while we behold the good actions of another man's life, we are more anxiously afraid of the deficiencies deficiencies of our own. So we note that in Gregory, this is incredible as well, by the way, because if you seem to have forgotten, we will go back to wisdom too. If you seem to have forgotten, you've got it right here. Let us, oh, uh, it's right here. And he is contrary to our doing. So let me pop this up here for you. Look at it right here. And he is clean contrary to our doings. You find it right here. So let me look. I, I am interested in. I, I want to look at the Greek. I, uh, I know uh, people may be wondering, William, what are you doing? Uh, I, I like getting interactive with you all. I is so much fun for me. Wisdom 2. I wonder. How the Greek reads. Let me see. So he is. This is interesting. Yeah, it lines up exactly with what is being said. Looking at this. The Kion Hati. Yep, right, man. They're very good. So this is um this is a very good point. He is righteous. So the point being made here by the author, the point being made, and I, I must confess, I had not even uh, grammatically examined that portion of wisdom too, but I see now why Gregory is, is saying he is clean contrary to our ways, contrary to us. So he's capturing wisdom 2.12 here. Christ is a fulfillment there. And then 2.15 right here. 
he is grievous unto us, even to behold, for his life is not like other men's, his ways are different. So why does Gregory note that he is clean, contrary to our doings? Verse 12, then hop on over there and combine that with verse 15. Where does the word clean appear there? It appears right there in the Greek where we're told that that individual is righteous. The only one that is truly righteous is our Lord and Savior, Christ. I pointed out to you the very usage right here. There it is. Dekion, right there. So he speaks of the righteous one. The Greek word dekion, utilized there. So Gregory the Great, masterful, or uh, um, masterful in his uh, in his orations, masterful in his letters, masterful in his theology, captures the true meaning of the text. He is clean contrary to our doings. He is righteous. He is truly righteous. The kion right there is a marker to give you the indication that Gregory knew exactly what the text was saying about Christ, the fulfillment being in our Lord and Savior. Notice also how when he begins speaking, he speaks of God's witnesses. Everything that he begins speaking about are things that give testimony to our Lord and Savior, that bring about the very truth of the gospel, the very truth that is being highlighted about Christ, ancient prophecies that have come to fulfillment, and indeed those words. Notice how he uses it right in the very context of the gospel, the gospel of Matthew. Just really, everywhere you look, this, this really, I got to be honest, with you, this is why the book of wisdom was never lacking, ever lacking from any of the canonical lists at any of the early church councils. I want to emphasize to you, the book of wisdom was not missing from any of the early church councils. I cannot emphasize it enough. It is a truth that should be trumpeted from the rooftops. It is a truth that is the reason it was quoted so much by the, or by the New Testament. I was going to say early fathers. Yeah, early fathers. Yeah. But the New Testament as well. And then later by early fathers. Indeed, the Epistle of Barnabas also has a marker that connects it to wisdom too. We'll probably examine that later. We'll break down the Greek to see is there any kind of similarity there. But that's a topic for a whole other show. We've got tons of stuff that we're going to talk to you all about. We, we don't, we go into the real meat and potatoes of the matter here. We really dig in deep here to really give you a strong defense of the deuterocanonical texts. There is indeed, and uh, I thought that I had also included, um, I thought I had included, um, there was another quote that I had. Let me see. This is, this is what I call a, a glitch. <laughs> so I, had, I thought I'd included one more father that I wanted to read. And apparently, for some reason, I didn't include him. So, unfortunately, that one father was actually Barnabas, and I plan to look at the text of Barnabas at a later time. So, that would explain why I didn't include Barnabas there. So, uh, how long have we been going? I didn't want to go over an hour. We've been going close to an hour. Uh, we'll go a few minutes more. Uh, drop questions in the chat. Before we wrap up, at around the one-hour mark, we're probably going to wrap up. Uh, but uh, we have not yet gotten to that one-hour mark. So I'll leave it right here in this really nice image for you all to see. So uh, before we get to the one-hour mark, I want to talk a little bit more uh, about what the significance is of me mentioning that the book of wisdom is not lacking from any counsel. So you will hear people then question and ask and wonder, well, is, is wisdom included in every um, 
list of uh, in every codex we've ever found, and any any list of codices, is it found in every single one of them? Now, how do you deal with an objection of that nature? I'm going to tell you how you deal with an objection of that nature. The one thing that we have got we must put much stock into, indeed, uh, the ecumenical councils, they hearken to the incredible testimony handed down to us from local synods. Now, our local synods of the level of an ecumenical one? No, of course not. Nobody's arguing that. But are they valuable to us? There's no doubt, there's just without a shadow of a doubt, the local synods are very valuable, incredibly valuable. If we look at the Council of Rome in 382, Hippo, Carthage, 393, 397, we look at any of those councils, and then, of course, councils that will come later, and we recognize the Book of Wisdom being present there, indeed, the other Deuterocanonical books as well, but today, for the sake of the topic of today being the Book of Wisdom, when we look and we notice that the Book of Wisdom is included there in those councils, that is a sense to recognize this was utilized in a very important fashion. So indeed, when we ask ourselves, well, you know, if they're not ecumenical, what kind of historical worth do they have? Well, clearly these councils gathered and in order to stamp out any kind of controversy, they provided canonical lists of texts. The list provided by Damasus was one that was of importance, enough importance that it was affirmed that this was part of the Bible. Now, here's the one thing you need to know. There are canonical lists later. There are lists um, such as uh, uh, papal decrees that would condemn books that were apocryphal. Now, we frequently hear arguments being brought up on the other side of people saying, well, you know what, people... Um, well, you know what, the book of, um, you know, the transitist literature, this literature, that literature was condemned, yada, 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 you know, all of this kind of stuff was condemned. So we're not here to talk about the transitist literature and, and whether or not it was condemned. What we're here to talk about is to note that there were apocryphal books, things that were called apocryphal ravings, things that were called the ravings of madmen books that were full of fables, books that in essence were put on the pile to be labeled as garbage. The Deuterocanonical books were never there. The Book of Wisdom was never there. Much to the protestations of modern day Protestants, the Book of Wisdom was never there. Much to the protestations of the Jews, Protestations that would have come that would come later, of course. So when we recognize that, we recognize those details that these early councils contain contain these books, you have got an incredible piece of information that only should only lead you deeper into a deeper love of everything due to canonical. So we're going to wrap up the show. I'm looking in the live chat. If there are any questions, please feel free to drop them now. If we don't get any questions, I'm going to break down the text one more time. And after I break it down, we will wrap it up because we're coming close to the one hour mark. Uh, we've had a great show, a great amount of people tuning in. I'm thrilled that so many people tuned in. Not a lot of people engaging in the chat, but that's okay. There's no problem. We begin with verse 10. Let us oppress the poor just man and not spare the widow nor honor the ancient gray hairs of the aged. But let our strength be the law of justice for that which is feeble is found to be nothing worth. Let us therefore lie in wait for the just Remember that Greek term for the righteous one, as Pope Gregory, Pope Gregory the Great indeed, noted. That righteous one is Christ. 
Let us therefore lie in wait for the righteous one, because he is not for our return, and he is contrary to our doings. He is clean, unlike us, as Gregory the Great noted, and upbraideth us with transgressions of the law. Wow. And divulgeth against us the sins of our way of life. He boasted that he hath the knowledge of God, and he calls himself the son of God. Remember what we examined earlier? Remember what we examined earlier? I am still blown away by the text. Remember what we looked at? It can literally be translated as Yahweh. Remember, brother, we saw that earlier? Look at that. Topai di kuriu. Remember, kurias. If referring to the God of the Old Testament, if referring to God in the Old Testament, Gurias means Yahweh. The same in the New Testament, depending on the context. And the context in wisdom, Solomon 2.13. Theu kai paida kuriu. The son of Yahweh. The divine son of Yahweh. That is something to really ponder about. The text is, the, the one thing that I've always noted is the supernatural nature of the text. And indeed, the book of wisdom is supernatural. What do we mean by supernatural? Well, Protestants love to hearken to that passage in Timothy that all scripture is God breathed, is theopnustos. We agree with them. It is supernatural. He boasts that he has a knowledge of God. Who could have the knowledge of God? Hmm. In order to be omniscient, to know everything, to have the knowledge of God, only God is all-knowing. Only God is all-knowing. Wisdom 2.13. Wisdom 2.13. Look at that. Gnosin, right here. The Greek Gnosin. He claims to know as God knows. To Gnosin. And we have Theu Kai Paida Guriu, Eauton. He calls himself a son of God. He claims to be all knowing. He claims to know. As God, only God is all knowing, and he calls himself the Son of God. Boom. If that is not mind blowing, I don't know what else can blow your mind away. If the text is telling you directly, he claims to be all knowing like God. He's called the Son of God. Who on earth is fulfilling that prophecy in the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew? That is why the fathers recognized it with such incredible strength. He's become a censor of our thoughts. He is grievous unto us, even to behold, for his life is not like other men's, and his ways are very different. As Pope Gregory the Great noticed, how, are his, how is he different? How is his life not like ours? Because he is the righteous one, as Pope Gregory the Great noted. We are esteemed by him as triflers, and he abstaineth from our ways, as from filthiness, of course, and he preferreth the latter end of the just, and glorieth that he hath God for his father. God's his father. Wisdom 216. I'm having fun looking at the Greek with you all. Patera theon. Put it right here. Patera theon. He has God. For his father. Let us see then if his words be true. And let us prove what shall happen to him. And we shall know what his end shall be. And we shall know what his end shall be. For if he be the true son of God, he will defend him. And he will deliver him from the hands of his enemies. Now, he was the true son of God, but he had to die. He had to suffer. He had to die on the cross 
Was he delivered? Of course he was. That's the bodily resurrection. Because he was delivered in the sense that he did not suffer corruption or condemnation in Hades. His body, as the book of Acts says, is no longer in the tomb. We've still got David's tomb with us and David's body, Peter says when preaching. But the Lord isn't there anymore. The Lord has bodily risen from the dead. That is the massive difference. So how will he be defended? How will he be delivered? He had to suffer. Let us examine by outrages, him by outrages and tortures. Now, how was he going to be rescued? Clearly not from death, because verse 20 says, let us condemn him to a most shameful death. He had to die. So what was the defense? What was the deliverance? It was the deliverance from corruption. But they misunderstood it. They thought he'd be delivered from the cross, from the death on the cross. He was a liar if he wouldn't believe be delivered, they thought. But they didn't realize that it was deliverance from corruption. It was deliverance from remaining dead in the tomb. He rose bodily from the dead. Our God, our incarnate God, is bodily risen. I hope this session has been edifying for you. For everybody tuning in, in the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit.